Welcome to Naming Ions. In the next few videos, we're going to be discussing the language of chemistry. It's important to have a consistent way of naming and describing substances so that scientists can communicate across the world. In this video, we're going to talk about how ions are named in preparation for discussing ionic compounds. So let's take a look at how ions are formed, uh, keeping in mind that ions are formed so that elements can reach a stable noble gas configuration in their valence shell. Let's look at some examples. Potassium is a metal that has one valence electron. Potassium can most easily reach a noble gas configuration by losing that one valence electron and becoming a potassium ion. And as we've mentioned before, this is a cation. And the name for this is simply the element, potassium, and the term ion. So K plus is a potassium ion. And this behavior of losing valence electrons to gain a noble gas configuration in the valence shell is very common for elements in group 1A, 2A, and 3A. If we look at some nonmetals, however, such as nitrogen, nitrogen has five valence electrons. So nitrogen is going to most likely so nitrogen is going to want to gain electrons to reach a noble gas configuration. If it can pick up an extra three electrons, it can then have a full octet and have a minus three charge. This behavior of gaining electrons to form anions is very common for elements in group 5A, 6A, and 7A. Elements in these groups will gain electrons to form anions. Now to name nonmetal anions is different than the metal ions. The metal ion naming took the element name potassium and just tacked on the word ion. For nonmetals though, the actual name changes and we get the IDE ending. Okay, this IDE suffix gets attached. So nitrogen in this case, nitrogen was the element, after it gains electrons, so it gains the three electrons, becomes the nitride ion. Nitride ion, again with this IDE ending at the end, to indicate that it has become an anion. Some other examples of this include oxygen, which becomes the oxide ion, fluorine, which gives us the fluoride ion. You may have heard of that being in toothpaste and things like that. And chlorine, which gives us the chloride ion. So we slightly modify the name by adding this IDE ending to show that it's a non-metal anion. And the pattern, or how these elements gain or lose electrons, can be seen really easily on the periodic table. We can see that group 1A typically gains a plus one charge when forming an ion. 2A does the same thing, plus two charge for group 2A. And group 3A, all the way over here, gives us a plus three. We can see the opposite happening for the non-metal ions formed over here, these anions. So group 5A gives us a minus three, group 6A gives us a minus two, and 7A gives us a minus one. Now there's a couple groups I left out here. For example, group 8 over here, group 8A, the noble gases, I did not write these in because these don't gain or lose electrons. They're already having, by being noble gases, they already have a noble gas configuration, a full valence shell. The other major group I left out is the transition block, right here. Okay? The transition metals in this inner block here have a slightly different naming scheme because they don't always just form one kind of ion. Transition metals can sometimes have multiple possible ions. The reason for this is because of their partially filled D sublevel. Now not all transition metals have multiple ions, but many of them do. So it's going to be a matter of getting used to which ones have them and which ones don't, and you'll get used to that with practice. But let's see how to deal with them when they do come up. Let's look at iron. Iron can form two different ions. It can have the Fe2 plus ion, or it can make the Fe3 plus ion. And because there are two different options, we have to name them as such. So the first one is called the iron 2 
ion. The next one is the iron 3 ion. You can notice that the Roman numeral after the name indicates the charge of the ion. Okay, the Roman numeral indicates the charge of the ion. However, if we look at an element like zinc, zinc only has one option. Zinc is a 2 plus ion only. It's not going to form any other kinds of ions. So we just call this a zinc ion. We do not call it a zinc 2 ion simply because it's a transition metal. So this one we don't use. We only use Roman numerals when there's multiple possibilities for the charges of the ions formed. Metal ions, nonmetal ions, and transition metal ions are all cases of atoms gaining or losing electrons. But we sometimes have cases where an entire molecule can act as a single unit and gain or lose electrons. When that happens, we have a polyatomic ion. We can break this word down. Poly, the first part of this, means many. So this is an ion made up of many atoms acting together as a group. Here are some examples of polyatomic ions. This list shows the formulas and charges for several polyatomic ions. And on this side, we have the names. So the names of polyatomic ions are fixed. They don't change. Anytime you have an SO4 2 minus group, it is a sulfate ion. This HSO4 group that has a negative 1 charge is called the bisulfate ion. And anytime this group is present in a molecule, it will just it will be referred to as bisulfate. So the naming for polyatomic ions is very simple because they have fixed names that we never alter. We never add the IDE ending to them. But you do have to become familiar with them so you can recognize them and name them appropriately. That wraps up our lesson on naming ions. Write down any questions you have from this lesson in your notes and bring them with you to class.